It's hard not to cheer for successful athletes, business people, musicians, and others who publicly praise God for their success. But while you root for their witness, do you sometimes wonder if others are secretly confused that success is a sign of God's blessing for faithful followers and challenges are a sign of failure? Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host, and today our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, covers this topic and so much more as we explore God's Word in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Before we get started, though, let's open the Bible bus mailbag and share a few inspiring letters that we've recently received from some fellow listeners. Here's one. This is from Pete in Boonville, Missouri. I've been riding the Bible bus for around three years. I listen every day before work. What a difference it's made in my life. Although I had read the Bible before, I was not quite getting it. I guess mainly how it all points to Jesus. I appreciate Dr. McGee's candor. Sometimes it does hurt like a knife through the heart, but at the same time, I feel the power of God's forgiveness. It's always such a humbling experience. Thank you for all your efforts in delivering God's Word. Well, that's a great letter, Pete. Thanks for writing and for joining us each day. Next, we've got a letter from Bridget in Austin, Texas. I've been on the Bible bus since 2003 while living in Michigan. I am back home in Texas now and have a permanent seat on the Bible bus. Two wonderful things have happened to me since I've committed to this study. I have faith in God such as never before. He loves us so much. He meets needs, solves problems, and answers questions. The second thing I've learned from listening to Dr. McGee is the simple, sound, biblical truths found in God's Word. Dr. McGee really does put the cookies on the bottom shelf. He wasn't afraid to say what God says, and we need this kind of teaching in our world today. I thank God for you, Steve and Greg, and the entire Through the Bible family. Keep doing what you're doing, getting the whole Word out to the whole world, Keep me in your prayers as I may be losing my job. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above that which we can ask or think. Well, you know, Bridget isn't alone. We often get letters with the same request. So if God brings it to mind, let's lift up our fellow listeners who are looking for work today. Ask God to meet their needs for meaningful employment and then providing for their needs. God will be faithful. And if God's using our time in his word to change and challenge you, would you share your story by emailing us at biblebus at ttb.org? Now let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that inspires us all. Regardless of where we live, we ask that you would speak to our hearts and draw us closer to you through this study. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now friends, the great theme of First Thessalonians is the rapture of the church. The great theme of Second Thessalonians is the revelation of Christ, and that's his coming to the earth to establish his kingdom. And we find Paul in Thessalonica, where he'd been less than a month, he taught these two great themes. And the thing that impresses me is the practicality of these doctrines. Now today, all schools of eschatology, that is of prophecy, have got this teaching way out in left field where it becomes sort of a extraneous sort of thing, that this is something that it's nice to talk about and argue about, but it's not too meaningful. You can't get it geared into life, and it doesn't seem to walk in shoe leather down here. Paul is certainly showing that it does. And in chapter 3, the theme here is the coming of Christ is a purifying hope. Change your life. Affect your lifestyle if you hold to the rapture of the church. That is the imminent coming of Christ for his own. It'll affect your life, and it doesn't. You really don't hold it. It's just sort of a theory. It's a philosophy for you. 
but when it affects you. Now, that's the heart of this epistle. Beginning here with chapter 3 and going through the fourth chapter, verse 12. The very heart of this epistle is that the coming of Christ for his church is a purifying hope. Now, Paul waited, you remember, over in Corinth for a report to come from Timothy and from, apparently, Silas and Dr. Luke, others that were there. Now he says here, as we open chapter 3, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. Now, apparently, Paul was with some of the brethren in Athens. And what actually happened was that these men that he was waiting for were actually Timothy and Silas. And I think others in the party were probably with Paul. And he says, wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. So he apparently sent all of them back, and that's when Paul spent his time alone there. Now, the wherefore is a rather important word that opens this chapter. You remember he talked about, in the last one, about the family relationship that exists in the church. He'd been a mother to the church. He'd been a father, and he was a brother. And as a brother, he loved them, you see. He led them to the Lord. And he says, as he closed the last chapter, he says, for ye are our glory and joy. When? At the coming of Christ, if you please. And that word coming is parousia. Now, I know that Paul used these terms for the coming of Christ interchangeably, but there are times when Paul puts in a real emphasis, and parousia means here the appearance of Christ, and that was naturally to believers. And here, that would be the time that believers would be rewarded. And this wherefore ties it back into the last chapter. It was because of his affection for them and his frustration in attempting to come to them, but Satan had hindered him, you see. And Paul had to leave Thessalonica so quickly that there were many unfinished teachings and doctrines that he had not been able to develop fully. And we're going to come to one of those a little later. And he not only longs to return, but he wondered about the future of the believers there. And Paul longed to comfort them. In other words, he demonstrates the thing he mentioned at the beginning, a labor of love. Now, friends, here is an example of love in action. Love is not affection or just a nice, comfortable, warm feeling around your heart. Love seeks the welfare of another. That's the way you express your love for anyone. You seek their welfare, and you'd actually jeopardize your own life for them if you love them, you see. So Paul says here in verse 2 of 1 Thessalonians 3, And I sent Timotheus, our brother. Here we are still talking about the brother. And a minister. He's a minister, you see. And the word minister here is diakonos. We get our word deacon from it. It means servant. And he's a minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. Now, the gospel of Christ is the sphere of service. That is, Paul was not just a do-gooder. And sometimes we're criticized because our main objective is to get out the Word of God, and we make that primary. And the fundamentalists are criticized that we do not emphasize the social aspect of the gospel. Well, there's never been any great social movement that was not anchored in the preaching of the gospel. The child labor laws came out of the great Wesley meetings, and the labor movement owes a great deal to John Wesley, although they don't recognize it because 
They're so far from that. But actually, that is the background of every great movement. The hospitals came out of the preaching of the Word of God. And if I do what I'm supposed to do, then these other things actually are going to take care of themselves. And after all, isn't all of this welfare program, hasn't it become one of the most corrupt things that probably has ever taken place in our government? I think the corruption from what we read and what we hear must be tremendous today. And why? Because it's not anchored in the gospel of Christ. You see, that's the sphere of service. And I've never really seen a do-gooder who did good. <laughs> the liberals today, what are they doing? <laughs> what good are they doing? They have done nothing in the world but encouraged immorality and license. They haven't lifted up mankind. They haven't taken these kids that are in drugs. Why well, I was in Portland, Oregon when there was a scandal broke out that that which the liberal churches was running was the place to go get the pill. That's where the girls went, and that's where you could get drugs, if you please. May I say to you, if we give out the gospel of Christ, that's our sphere of service. And Paul says that Timothy was a servant, and this was the sphere of his service. And believe me, friends, when that is given out, there'll be a lot of doing good that'll take place. And the do-gooders, the only criticism I've ever had of them is they just don't do good. If they do good, it'd be wonderful. If they were helping folk today, lifting them up. But I just don't discover that. Maybe I'm looking in the wrong direction. I don't know. Now, will you notice here, he goes on to say, may he establish you and comfort you concerning your faith. Now, to establish them is a very wonderful word. It was used back in the book of Exodus when Moses, you remember, went to the mountain, held up his hands in prayer, and when he did, the children of Israel were given a victory, and there's a great spiritual lesson there. In Exodus 17, verse 12, let me read that. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone put it under him, he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And it says that they stayed up the hands of Moses. Now that's the same word here that he sent Timothy over to stay up, to hold them up, to establish them you see. And today people need to be established in the faith. And the word comfort here actually means to encourage. He sent him over there now to hold them up, to establish them, and then to comfort them or to encourage them in the faith. Now in verse 3 I read that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are pointed thereunto. Now, here is a very wonderful statement, and it's hard to swallow for any of us, for that matter. He says here, and let me just break it apart and look at it, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. The word moved means disturbed. And the word for affliction here are the pressures, the tension. And then he says something here that is absolutely amazing. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Now, appointed means that you and I are to go through storms down here. But they're temporary, and we can't escape them. It's made very clear to us in the Word of God that you and I are to have trouble down here. And Paul wants the Thessalonians to stand for the Lord in the midst of afflictions. Now, friends, if you're a believer, you're not going to escape trouble. To accept Christ doesn't mean to take out an insurance policy that you'll never suffer loss. 
fact of the matter is, actually, the minute you become a child of God, that means you're going to start having trouble. Even if you haven't had it before, you're going to have it when you become a child of God. Now, that is exactly what the Lord Jesus taught. Over in John 16, 33, will you listen to this? He says, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. And that's not the great tribulation. That's the little tribulation. That is the trouble that all of us are going to have. And he says there's no way around it. In the world ye shall have trouble, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Here we go again. Be of good cheer in trouble? Yes. My friend, many of God's children are learning and knowing what trouble is. Now, the amazing thing is he has promised to lead us through the trouble. The way that it has been expressed is this. He didn't say that we would miss the storm. Fact of the matter is he said we would go through the storm, all the storms of life. The thing he did say very definitely and dogmatically, he said we were going to make the harbor because any little boat that he's on board isn't going to the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. It's going to the other side, and we're in the process of going to the other side. Now, Paul reinforced that in 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There are no ifs, ands, buts about it. Now, may I say this to you? As a child of God, is the sky clear for you? There's no cloud. There's not a ripple on the sea of life for you today. Everything is smooth and everything is just nice for you. May I say, if it is like that, then you might question your salvation. But if you are experiencing trouble down here and the pressures and tensions of life are on you, I have news for you. That's one of the signs that you're God's child. I notice that God's children suffer a great deal, and one of the most wonderful things is it's going to be temporary. You're going to come through it. I remember years ago of hearing about a church in Memphis, Tennessee, where the pastor asked for verses of Scripture. And one man got up, and he says, it came to pass. And he sat down. Everybody looked puzzled. And the pastor said to him, well, brother, how in the world can that statement, it came to pass, be your favorite verse? Well, he says, when I get in trouble and it comes to me, I turn to where it says it came to pass. And I know it came to pass. It didn't come to stay. And I thank God that I'm going to get out of the storm and get rid of my trouble. What a wonderful thing. He may have misapplied that verse, but his theology is absolutely accurate, and it's according to what Paul is saying here. Now let me continue to read on here. Verse 4, he says that, For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation. And this is the same word, afflictions. As I've said before, the church will not go through the great tribulation. It'll go through the little tribulation. We're all going to have a little trouble down here, and it's for a purpose. Why? Even as it came to pass, and ye know, for this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Now, the tempter here is none other than Satan, as we saw back in verse 18 of the second chapter. He says, but Satan hindered us. Paul says he's given me a bad time, and I know he may be giving you a bad time over there. In other words, afflictions test the genuineness of the coin of belief. Someone has said that trouble is the acid that tests the genuineness of a coin of belief. You know, there are a lot of counterfeits, and there are a lot of counterfeit Christians. And the thing that will really reveal the genuineness of your faith is that 
whether you can endure trouble or not. Afflictions reveal a genuine believer, and this is the occasion of his rejoicing. Now he says, but now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and love, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. You know, friends, that's quite wonderful that Paul got word from them, and the word was that it was a good report, and they were enduring trouble, and Paul now says to them, he's having trouble. Therefore, brethren, this is verse 7 now, 1 Thessalonians 3, therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith, for now we live if we stand fast in the Lord. We live here means that as believers, we enjoy life. <laughs> and if here is sense, I think that we should know, since ye stand fast in the Lord, and even in trouble, you can enjoy it. And that's not easy to do, my friend. But Peter made that statement over in 1 Peter 4, chapter, verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that shall try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Friend, you can't lose being a Christian, even if you have trouble. It's going to work out for your good. You can always be sure of that. My, how wonderful this is. Now he says here in verse 9, For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? Joy is associated with life, and sorrow is associated with death. Sorrow increases a capacity of the heart, though, for joy. And my, that's what Paul is talking about here. I want you to rejoice. Being a Christian is a wonderful thing. Now Paul says here, look here, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. In other words, his labor in Thessalonica was very rudely interrupted. He's run out of town. And Paul says, I would like to come and continue my teaching ministry. And friends, Paul wanted to teach the Word of God. He wanted to get the Word of God out. And that, to me, is the most comforting thought that I have in my own heart I want to get the Word of God out, and I feel kinship for this brother here. The important thing, friends, is to get the Word of God out. It's not to keep the through the Bible radio on the air. It's to get the Word of God out. That's the important thing, and if I quit giving it out, I hope the Lord will take me off there. Verse 11, now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. Oh, how Paul prayed, come unto them. Now he says, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. What a wonderful thing this is here. You see, love is not affection. It seeks the welfare of another here. And the end was, love was not an end in itself, that they might develop a character of holiness. And here's a statement I've given you before. If you were tried in court for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Because we're going to appear before him, and he's going to judge our works. Let me mention something else. It may terrify you, but let's mention it. He's also going to judge our character as believers. Now, this is to see whether we receive a reward or not. My Christian friend, what kind of life are you living today? That's important. That's a very personal and important question Dr. McGee just asked. 
If you'd like to know more about how to live a godly life, then I suggest you download Dr. McGee's booklet called Living the Christian Life God's Way. It's available for free in the resources section at ttb.org. And while you're there, why don't you check out the more than 100 booklet downloads that we make available, including a brand new one called Fruitful Living. In it, Dr. McGee tells us how producing the fruit of the Spirit fulfills God's purpose for our lives. It's a handsome booklet, one that you can easily recommend to a friend. And of course, if we can recommend a resource by Dr. McGee to deepen your knowledge of and love for God's Word, then call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Again, it's 1-800-65-BIBLE. Or you can write to Through the Bible, Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Tomorrow, the Bible bus returns to 1 Thessalonians for more in this terrific study. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here saving a seat just for you. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.